experiencing the things that are on this campus. They're, according to another person who is named Dylan Gill, who has also left the church and was a member of Sea Org. Uh, and Dylan Gill evidently oversaw the construction of CST. There's a log cabin primed and set up for the return of L. Ron Hubbard. And there's also a structure that is set up for the VIPs, such as David Miscavige and guys like Tom Cruise and a couple of the other famous people that we've talked about to, to go in the event of nuclear Armageddon. So is this a, an underground bunker? Sort of thing. Mm-hmm. I would you guess would it's so. not above ground. That seems kind of counterintuitive. Yeah. So that's kind of uh, kind of interesting, though. I mean, I, I guess the rank and the file. Um, the rank and they'll the, come the, back. The, the rank and file is like your host, dude. Sorry, it's just, it's just us and our celebrity pals. <laughs> yeah, I, and a whole lot of booze. <laughs> See, I don't, that's actually not listed anywhere. It's interesting, yeah. actually. The but. the pictures of this place, right? As you were saying, is like wrought iron fence with whatever, and there's like one house on a hill. And, like, that seems to be the only kind of above-ground structure. structure. Everything else is, like, underground or, like, weird cutouts or in the turf or whatever. Mm-hmm. So, it's, yeah, it probably is all a bunch of underground well, and And stuff. Rousseau says that he says that... For seven years, Michelle has lived and worked on the campus or the compound, whichever you want to call it, working to preserve those writings of L. Ron Hubbard. So it, it, it's, it's possible that she was there at one point and then she went somewhere else. We don't know. Well, I- but people have said that i mean a lot of, several people have come forward and said no she's there i guess i i could see is like in a combination of that this theory and the previous theory right is that like okay so what she decided to do with her life is like become essentially like a monk transcribing the religious uh, no, texts yeah. Well, I guess yeah, no. A monk, monks did the, the monks transcription. Are the ones You're who right. Did the transcription, you know, and so she just like lives on this compound, and like that's her life, and that's fine. But then, it, like, it, but then again, it's that question of like, why wouldn't they just say, "Oh, sh- that's what she decided to do." <laughs> that's, that yeah. satisfies everybody's curiosity. I mean, that's, I just that's uh, a good point. You yeah. know, uh, it, it could be too that maybe she she accepted that life because the alternative was was banishment, complete banishment from the church. You know, it was for her, it was, would, would have been maybe pretty devastating. Equal to a death sentence, yeah. 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 There's another possibility, though, too, which is that her husband was basically sick of her and wanted to be rid of her. Not necessarily for for reasons that are her fault. Sounds like he's kind of, I don't know. Well, well Hard to get along with. Yeah, it sounds like, yeah. Uh, so he might have just wanted to be rid of her. And so and he might have just said, look, I want you to leave the church because I just don't want to be have anything to do with you anymore. So here's the deal. We'll send you a check for a couple hundred grand a year so you can live comfortably. You go off somewhere, we'll, we'll establish you in a new identity. You go live wherever you want to live, we'll send the checks. And she just did that. She just left and took on a new identity. That's. Because, I mean, people uh, do it. Yeah, because... Uh, and it might be, it might well be that maybe they had some discussions and maybe she might have actually at this point have, have been thinking, you know... Uh, I really don't believe this stuff anymore because here we're talking about... Breaking faith. Yeah, yeah, because it it would be hard to to be around and see all these abuses of power and this really kind of quasi-totalitarian structure and nature of the church and not at some point see the the basic clash with the, the original writings of L. Ron Hubbard which he was talking about peace, love, dope, and all that stuff. And, and you look at the actual behavior of the church brass. And, and she you, was and, involved with Hubbard involved from, from her childhood. Like she was in the Sea Org, so she yeah. was spent a she lot was, of time with him. She worshipped him. She, yeah. yeah, she totally did. But it might have been that she was just totally disillusioned. I guess, for me, that seems like something that happens earlier in life. You know, I think that like, and that's a generalization to be sure, Yeah. but it just kind of seems like you hit a point where you're just kind of committed to that. All right. You've made that marriage. Your whole life has been this thing. You're in it. And maybe, you know, maybe it was the kind of like abuses or like the aggression that she experienced from her, her husband or from, you know, other people. I don't know, but it just kind of seems like you get disillusioned in your like 
early 20s like that's kind of the general time that like people leave teens and 20s so i don't know i mean steve's shaking his head at me but he might have i i I totally i i I have to totally disagree okay that's and that's totally fair well there's 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 stories of people who are in religions or relationships that don't hit their breaking point until they're in their 50s, 60s, 70s, and then they finally come to the realization that what they think is no longer what is. So I'm not disagreeing sure. with you that she may have become disillusioned, but I'm saying that doesn't necessarily always happen as a 20 or 30 something. Yeah, I guess this this whole case is just like so frustrating to me because it just the, the the it's frustrating because the church just refuses to elaborate at all mm-hmm. you know it's just like there are there are so many explanations and all of them could be totally reasonable if they would just say oh hey one small minor detail but they're just like mm, no we said the one like tiny super can like it's just like this huge like blanket statement this is what we said, and that, that's it. That's all you get. That's all you get about this person who's been, like, literally not heard from for seven, six, seven years. And that That's the thing that really bothers me is that it's just like, hey, we made this one blanket statement seven years ago, so you all should be good. Just Here's, chill. Here, to me, is one of the hardest facts to reconcile with, and it also, in a way, is the most heart-wrenching. entirely possible that all of this is her decision. Absolutely. It is entirely possible that she has decided to do this and whether she has put herself into exile intentionally or she is doing something that isn't a state of exile, if it's her choice and from the things that I have read, she was not happy, the worst part is... Is that the person who could solve it the easiest is her by saying, I'm done. And and now we're kind of dealing with sort of little minor variations, I think, on theories. I I think a minor variation on on my theory, which is that he wanted her gone and paid her off. Another another possibility is that she suddenly realized that she couldn't deal with it anymore and she didn't believe it anymore and she just Right, that's what Devin and I were just kind of quasi debating, arguing about. And it might have been because, well, here you got that would be kind of a blow to the church because uh, the the wife of the head of the church leaves the church. And this would be, you know, shortly thereafter followed by his niece leaving. Yeah. I mean, that's, yeah. that's a double yeah. damaging blow. Absolutely. Yeah, and so, uh, you know, they can't, even if they have her locked up, it's kind of hard to keep somebody locked up forever. I mean, it's possible. But it might have been a, that they just thought, well, okay, maybe what we're going to do here is pay you off get you a new identity and you go somewhere and we just won't talk about it. Right. Well, Some yeah, people, you've, so you've, you've left gone the there before. I mean, so yeah, that's exactly what, yeah. No, so I'm trying to figure well, out what, what, what's, no, no, what's I mean, the what's, new bit that no, you're I mean, in what, here. The, the difference is well, between my, my earlier one is that, is that in the first, in the first one, it was her husband's idea. He wanted her gone. And, uh, and my, so you're saying, saying now it could be now, her it, idea. But another, another, it, it could be that she just wanted out really bad. And that because, you know, not only would it be damaging because she's the wife of the head of the church, but also she knows where the bodies are buried. And I mean that euphemistically, of course. I guess, <laughs> yeah. You know, but, uh, uh, the, you know the, the big, like, question mark in my mind is that, like, okay, so I just, mm, I can't imagine existing and hearing pleas from, like, good friends that are saying, like, hey, where are you? Like, we're worried about you. Like, what's going on? And just, like, ignoring it. You know what I mean? So, like, for me, there are, I guess, a couple options. One is that, like, she's not hearing them because she's dead. One is that she's not hearing them because she's locked up or quarantined somewhere. In isolation. In isolation. And then, uh, you know, the third one just, like, wouldn't make sense to me is that, like, she's hearing them and choosing to ignore them. Because, like, you know, we've all been in those situations where we're like, well, I don't really want to talk to that friend. But if a friend is like, hey we were super close and you literally have just dropped off the face of the earth and I don't understand. Can you just like, tell me you're okay. Like give me one sign that you're okay. And you're, and that person is so worried about you for six years. Can you imagine just ignoring somebody who was like your best friend for a really long time 
And like for six years, that person is reaching out to you and saying like, I just want to know you're okay. Like, it's cool. If we don't need to be friends anymore, that's fine. But like, I just want to know if you're okay. So for me, it's just those two theories of like, she's not hearing it because she's dead or she's not hearing it because she doesn't have access to it. You know, I just can't imagine being in that position because it's not just one friend. Surely there are other people in the organization who are saying like, hey, we miss Michelle. What's going on with her? Like, we want to talk to her. It's it's, well, it's hard to imagine, but there are there are plenty of examples of people who have left family members behind, whether it's one or all, and they still had contact, and they still heard those pleas for contact. And they chose to ignore them, whether they were out of anger or guilt or whatever it may be. People do that. I guess, I'm, not, I'm not belittling your. Yeah, no, where, but where I guess going, I guess but. my like my big thing is like with um, what's her name, Leah? What's her name, the actress, right? Oh, Ramini. Yeah, yeah. So, right, I, I can see like if you want to stay in the church. You like you don't necessarily like talk to that those people who are in the church, but then once somebody leaves, you talk to that. You know, I think that there's there's so much room there. I don't know. But the thing about it is, is you don't know that she hasn't contacted Leah Ramini. She wasn't close to very many people in the church at all, from what I understand. At some point, um, she could obviously, if she's been paid off and told to disappear then she was probably also, as part of the agreement, told she can't contact anybody. I, yeah, that's but, certainly true. But I guess, like, the two people, right, would be, like, Leah Romini and... Yeah, Leah Romini, yeah. The niece. Yeah, and the niece. But you don't know. These people, have, these people have, have gone public and said that they want to know where she is. But Leah Romini wasn't doing it for years and years and years. I mean, it was like, when did she start actually asking? It wasn't, like, in 2007. It was quite a while after that. I, I don't remember when that. Tom Cruise got married. But at Tom yeah. Cruise's wedding, I think that's really she got into hot water because she asked at the wedding. Yeah, where is she? Where is she? Yeah, exactly. And so she probably asked a few times, she, and she asked a few times again. And Michelle, knowing you know, hearing these reports and, and hearing about it, probably found a way to covertly contact her and let her know that she was okay. So, so but if she, if Michelle had contacted Leah Ramini, then then after she was done reassuring her that she was okay. The next thing she would have said to her is, I want you to keep asking where the hell I am because they can't know that I've talked to you. And if you stop asking where I where I am, they're going to smell a rat. So she might very well have been in contact with Leah Remedians and a few other people. But in, other, in order to cover that up, they've got to keep asking the question. Fair. Uh, yeah, yeah I, I really feel like we just took and drew a bunch of scribbles on a piece of paper uh, and then just okay. tried to link them all together. Yeah. This yeah. Is just, I think we just did like so a bunch difficult. of different dots and we were I like, do, oh, connect them to something. I, I do want to say, Leah Ramini, I, I, I hope you find her. I hope you've already found her. And what you need to do next time is go file a missing persons complaint. And when the detectives go out to have an interview with her, you must insist on going along. That, yeah, that would yeah. that would solve our double issue. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't know. It's just, it's so huge and confusing, and this whole thing is just like a mess of like spaghetti monsters. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and and obviously, unfortunately, we haven't solved it. No, mm-hmm. we definitely yeah. haven't solved it. No, no. Oh, actually, I, I, actually, I'm going to give Leo a little bit more advice. Better idea still. <laughs> the, the detectives, <laughs> the detectives have to bring her to see you, and that which means that she has to leave the compound. And if there's a problem with that, for heaven, for heaven's sakes, why would there be a problem with her leaving the compound? <laughs> then, you know, then they'll come and see you. And if there is a problem with leaving the compound, well, the detectives can call on the SWAT team and do it. <laughs> that's, that's, yeah. No, I, I can't. I, that would work. Absolutely. Well, we're gonna we're gonna stop with the story because I think that we have literally run down every alley and rabbit hole mm. and conceivable that we could come up with in however long we've been talking. Now I don't so even know long. anymore. Um, if you have any thoughts on this story, you can of course let us know. You can always go ahead and put a comment on our website. Mm-hmm. That website is thinkingsidewayspodcast.com. At the same time, you can of course listen to and download episodes from the website Uh, if you're not using that you can of course use itunes if you're on itunes do take the time to leave a comment and a rating yeah that helps other people find us and everybody we're getting a bunch of new people and it's fantastic uh we are on twitter 
not super active on Twitter, but we we're there. try really hard. We do try. Uh, you know, we do. I, I never tweeted. <laughs> I got to do it one of these days. I have. We're giving it oh, the old college I will try. Uh, we are on Facebook. We have the Facebook page and the Facebook group, and uh, we're having some. I've been having some really fun discussions on there. Uh, there's a number of different places that you can stream the show. Uh, you can do it on Stitcher. There's uh, uh, FM something or other. I can't even think about it. I mean, there's a whole a, a slew of places that we're streaming online. And, of course, if you're Michelle, you can always just send us an email. Yeah. yeah please do. We would love that. Actually, if she's cloistered away in that little spot, maybe she all, all she has to do is listen to podcasts. Maybe. Uh, Hi, Michelle. Yeah. Uh, you can send us an email at thinking. Sideways podcast at gmail.com. And speaking of email, we do have one listener mail that I wanted to share. Uh, I know that this is a big episode. We normally don't do it, but it's a little pertinent to some things that are going on. Uh, so, first off, this email is from Alyssa. And she said that she, uh, she I found the podcast a while ago and it's my new favorite. Uh, I listen to them when I'm walking my dog and it keeps me entertained for an hour or so while she patrols the the neighborhood, hmm. which I believe is code for uses the neighbor's lawn. I agree. Uses the neighbor yes. for a latrine. <laughs> yeah. uh, but she, she, of course, you know, she likes the fact that there's a variety. We're doing not only UFOs or missing persons, but we do the whole slew and anything and everything that we come across. But she did bring up one concern that I wanted to talk to everybody about, which is that she wasn't able to download the episodes off of the website like we have continually told everybody they could. I apologize, guys. Uh, it turns out the player that we were using... It sort of broke at one point, and I'm not quite sure when. Uh, and uh, she, as well as uh, one or two other people, let me know this week. They all kind of came at once and said, hey, this isn't working. Uh, by the time this episode comes out, that'll be fixed. We will replace the player, and we will make sure that you're able to download the show. Mm -hmm. So, sorry about that, but it's fixed now. Yeah, thank God. When this happens. Yeah, when this happens. By the time, uh, yeah. by the time you're hearing this. Yep. Yeah, in that couple of weeks, I'll have figured out a solution. Um, <laughs> <laughs> all right, T guy over here. All right. Uh, well, that's all I've got on this. So uh, thanks, everybody, and we'll talk to you next week. Yeah. So long, folks. Bye, guys. <laughs>I'm really, really stoked about this. On March 7th at noon Pacific Standard Time, Team Sideways is going to host an AMA on the Unresolved Mysteries subreddit on Reddit. Pretty exciting. Right? Hell yeah. Yeah. So the mods will post an announcement a week prior. So if you can't join us at that time, at that date, you can post your questions there. Um, please don't email us questions we'll lose them and forget them <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. For sure. let's try and contain this just to reddit but we're super excited and uh yeah so if you can join us and march 7th 2015 march 7th, 2015 sorry just yeah. in case somebody you know five years from now is listening to this episode not 2017 this is not true yourself 2017 sorry thinking sideways i don't understand Stories of things we simply don't know the answer to. Well, hey everybody, and welcome back again to another episode of Thinking Sideways. I am Steve. Of course, I am joined by... Oh, Devin. And Joe. <laughs> you just gestured to the middle of us. I don't know what you're pointing at. Yeah, That's what, I thought he was, was pointing point. more towards you, so I was well, going to let you go ahead. <laughs> Uh, I did, so... Oh, we're off to a rockin' good start there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry for the misunderstanding, folks. Uh. Well, this week we, of course, have another mystery that we want to bring to you. This one has no dead bodies. No. No, it does not. No people in at all, really. Nah. Well, I think I have one. Maybe two, but yeah, no, mostly this is no people. Oh, well, I didn't do any mm -hmm. research on it. So it's got some gophers know. in it. Yeah, yeah, it's got some critters. Yeah. Uh, what we're going to talk about today is a geologic mystery. 
and it's kind of geographically specific. Uh, our subject is what is known as the Mima Mounds. Mima. And if you've never heard of these, but you've read this on the internet, you might think that the name is Mima. Which I was under the false understanding that was the name, too, until I started watching some YouTube videos and realized I was pronouncing it incorrectly. Ah. Oopsie. Yeah. The Mima Mounds are located in Washington State. They are they're near Olympia, Tumwater area of Washington. They're kind of like if you folks have seen maps of Washington, you know where Puget Sound is. They're like southeast of Puget Sound. Yeah, they're in the the, yeah. the southwestern portion of the state. Mm-hmm. Their name comes from the actual area that they're located in, which is known as the Mima Prairie. And and you will come across mounds like this, which we're going to give some description of this, so bear with me here. We're going to describe them a little bit, but this kind of mound is found in other places in the continental United States, as well as other places across the globe. Mm -hmm. I think the only place that this kind of structure is not found is Antarctica, and well, that's because it's mostly ice. Yeah. It's probably probably found there, but it's buried under snow and ice. Mm. Oh, yeah, but I... Possibly. I don't know if that's true. But they're they're relatively consistent uh, all across the U.S. But, again, I'm going to focus on the ones that are in Washington. So we're going to just work on those. But if you do see some research on these in other areas of the country, you'll see them referred to as prairie mounds, Pimple mounds, Ew. hog. Yeah, I know. I agree. <laughs> hog wallow mounds. There's a few others that are out there, uh, but the mystery, of course, about these things is that nobody knows how they were made or how they were formed. I know that's the interesting thing is that the uh, we, they know all about all kinds. Of, you know, limestone cave. Hey, they figured it out. Plate tectonics. They figured that out too, but they can't figure out these stupid little mounds. I don't get it. <laughs> Well, maybe you will after this. Okay. Maybe we'll solve it. Mm, Maybe. Probably. I doubt it. Uh, The Mima Mounds, to give you a description of them, are round dome-like bulges of the soil that are raised above the plane of the surrounding landscape. So here's here's the, uh, the description. They will range anywhere from... 10 feet to over 160 feet across. Wow. And they can be anywhere as short as one foot to as high as six plus feet high. So this is, when I say kind of a bulge in the landscape, I really mean it's a giant dome-like bulge. It's kind of roundish. Those numbers that I'm giving, those are... The average range, there are, of course, some that are smaller and some that are bigger, but Mm. that's the general normal range that they've been found to be. It's hard to pin down how many you're going to find in an area. Mm. It can be anywhere as few as one or two to upwards or over 400 mounds in a hectare. A hectare. It's a hectare. I totally was going to mess that one up. (laughs) Um, A hectare is, just to give you some number, because that's a random number or word that you don't hear used a lot. It's 107,600 plus square feet. And that's about two and a half acres. Two and a half acres. Yeah. Yeah. That's a much easier Mm. number. I wish I'd thought to put it that way. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Uh, and, and the weird thing is, is that their their dis- distribution over that area will be fairly consistent. Now, this is when there's a bunch of them, mm. not when there's one or two. But if there's a hundred of them, they're relatively evenly spaced. If there's four hundred of them, they're evenly spaced. So almost weird. As if they're in a grid or a hex pattern. Mm. Uh, not yeah, sort of. I mean, sort of. It's yeah, sort it's, of random. It's a but very at the same loose time, it's... pattern, but it's a pattern nonetheless. Oh yeah, uh, it's, it's semi regular. That's for sure. Which is rare in nature, right? You don't see that a whole lot by natural. Although there, there is some. Um, when we're getting the theories, there's some things that we'll talk about that might help explain okay. why it's in such a regular distribution. Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, in, in in nature, I mean, things things actually like if you look at a forest, for example, 
it's actually kind of regularly dis- distributed because yep. distributed. I mean, because I mean, obviously they're not going to all the trees are not going not going to all crowd together, and right. they're going to and they're not going to like space themselves way out. So I mean, they see a lot of kind of regular distributions in nature, actually. Fair, fair. Exactly, and 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 we will get into a better description of that later. Um, I'm going to warn everybody now. As we go through this this story or this description, I'm going to end up using quite a few analogies to help describe some of this. The first one of which is how I think of the mounds. I kind of think of them the easy way that I can think of the Mima mounds is that they're, yeah, they're the goosebumps of the earth. They're just really small, weird little bumps. But I also think of volcanoes as kind of the pimples of the earth. God, so. You're so weird. <laughs> Well, volcanoes are actually more like boils. Yeah. Yeah. They explode. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. Okay, we're okay, going to let no that more go. Gross humor. No more of that. Um, and this is a terrible time for me to remember, but before we get too far along, uh, this was a listener suggestion. Oh. Eric emailed this to us quite a long time ago. Hey, Eric, I hope you're still with us. Yeah. yeah. I really hope th- that my terrible description of these or analogy didn't put you off but uh really appreciate this suggestion i was really glad when i found this one in the list because it's it's really unique and interesting yeah mm, it's a little different than mm-hmm. what we usually do because usually that involves murder exactly yeah uh there's no murder here mm. except of you, my grammar you don't know there might be could be a lot of dead people in those bounds Actually, there isn't. I know. Uh, <laughs> I know. That's the best part because when Western explorers first came to the Wash- what is now Washington State, they, of course, looked at these mounds and went, I'll bet those are burial mounds of the local natives. And the next thing they said was, hey, let's dig them up. <laughs> <laughs> and, and they were disappointed. They were very disappointed because all they found was dirt and rocks. Oh. There was no bodies. Okay. Uh, I guess the joke was on them. Yeah. <laughs> Interestingly enough, uh, there is, from what I've read legends from the natives of the area that say that the mounds were created either a by a large spirit i think it's a spiritual blue jay if i remember who mm-hmm. flew over and dropped the mounds and that's how they came to be so they're or like a comet that flew over and left them in its wake well yeah. it so would the- make sense i mean haley's comet yeah. It's fairly frequent in this area. And these are like enormous blue jay droppings. Is that kind of mm. the way the Indians put it? Maybe. Have yeah. you ever had a blue jay fly over your car and seen what happens? It, <laughs> it, it, could, yeah. be, it could be quite could the be. mess. Yeah. So it, it quite could be. Uh, but, well, thankfully for us, some real scientific types, this would be soil scientists, uh, actually went out and they, uh, they, they dug into the mounds to try to figure them out. And what we're going to go through now is the physical description of a Mima mound. And this is where I'm going to use the first analogy, be, or set of analogies, to describe the layers of the earth. Because if you've never thought of it this way, the easy way to think about the layers of soil that make up the crust of the earth is to think about it as a layer cake. Mm. They they might be thicker, thinner vertically, but they are in bands. And it's it's just a simple way to to kind of envision it. Yeah, I think a lot of people know about that. Well, I would think so, but I I don't know that everybody does, so I just like to put it out there. So the tasty part, of course, is the top of the mound. It is, because after, it's the icing on the cake. Yeah, after you pluck out the candles, and you, <laughs> yeah, you go to town on that Joe's stuff. Joe's turned the earth into a birthday cake. I just don't really like it. I'm just like carrying it. out your analogy further, you know. <laughs> <laughs> the, the The top of the cake is the icing, which, mm. as Joe was alluding to... Is uh, really tasty. It is, well, that top layer, that icing layer of the cake, of the ma- Mima, Mima mounds... I, I was going to say Mima cake. Okay. Yeah. Dag nabbit. The Mima mounds are covered in prairie grass. So that prairie grass would be that icing layer. Now, it's not always going to be prairie grass, but typically in that area, that's what it's going to be. You dig below that into the first layer of earth, and you're going to encounter what is known as the A-horizon. And when you're dealing with soil science, 
every layer is going to be called a horizon. So I'm just going to let everybody know we're going to use the horizon name several times. The A horizon, typically it's going to be topsoil, which is going to be kind of that dark earth layer. It's full of vegetation that's mm. rotted. It's got worms. It's got bugs and other little critters in it. That's the layer that plants will typically start to live off. It's got the most mineral content and all all the decomposing materials in it. Now, somehow the uh, the cake analogy is not holding for me here, though. Because you don't want to eat that? <laughs> yeah, it doesn't sound that it's so It's like the rich all. German chocolate part. Thank you, Devin. You're welcome. Yeah, Thank you, with Devin. a lot of disgusting stuff. <laughs> no, yeah. lots of walnuts and, and grapes. Like, <laughs> raisins. I don't know. I'm not good at dessert. I don't know. Okay. Let's get back to describing it and less thinking about eating it. Mm. The A horizon, like I said, topsoil, and that's where the plants typically will start to live. Now, I admit, and I know right off the bat, anybody who knows something about this say, well, that's not the only layer of the, the, the soil that plants live off, and I get that, but that's the primary layer that you're going to see things like grass and small shrubs actually live in. Shallow rooted. Shallow rooted. Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That's the perfect, yeah. perfect way to describe mm -hmm. it. Below that, now, oh, actually, before we get below that, we should probably describe the makeup of the A Horizon, mm. which is going to be what is referred to as a loamy soil. And loam is in a varying mixture, can be heavy on one side or the other, or evenly mixed. You're going to have silt, you're going to have sand, and to some degree, you're going to have clay. Mm -hmm. So that, that's what it all is. Plus, mixed in there, there's going to be some small stones, gravel, and large stones. Yeah. That's the A-Horizon. Below that, which, unfortunately for Joe, I'm going to say again, is the next layer of the cake. Mm. Mm, tasty. <laughs> is typically a layer of gravel and stone and soil materials that is referred to as the b and or C horizons. It can be one, the other, or both. Mm. The This layer can also be relatively hard packed. It's got a higher proportion of clay in it. Sure, yeah. Which is something that's important to keep in mind because that clay will help hold moisture, which is really important when you think about the state of Washington because yeah. the state of Washington, hmm. it's fairly rainy. Yeah. A little bit. And it's pretty dang rainy. <laughs> it's pretty damp. What happens in these prairies is that in the winter and the spring, it's kind of boggish. Mm. Standing water or very sodden soil. Mm. Come the summer and fall, it dries out, and then the cycle repeats, which from an ecological standpoint is actually really important because yeah. it lets a lot of things grow that wouldn't grow anywhere else around that because they need all that water. Yeah, and the clay, the the b and c horizon typically really hold on to that water even in the dry summer months you know we don't get so dry and hot that it our ground totally dries out typically sometimes we do but generally not especially in something like this with when it's boggy that clay is going to hold on to a lot of that moisture and allow plants to grow year round where they typically wouldn't correct yeah if, if it's an exposed plane that didn't have all that clay that water would go down into the mm -hmm. soil and as the heat came evaporate out of the upper layers and then yeah. those plants you it's uh if you've ever seen uh grassland in the summer and it all the grass is relatively dead yeah it's dried out it mm -hmm. can't live anymore and it's waiting for the next rainfall to germinate again this is not the case in these locations because of that clay layer mm -hmm. uh th and and what we're talking about here this boggy kind of area is what is referred 